You're tuned into the Writing Community Chat Show, the live streaming YouTube podcast that brings you the stories of authors, screenwriters and more. Indie or established, this show's for the community and we invite you to be a part of it. Head to the writingcommunitychatshow.com for more info. The WCCS, together as one, we get it done. Hello and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. Hello everybody and welcome to a Wednesday edition of the Writing Community Chat Show. We've got a great show coming up for you tonight and a great guest who I have spoken to before so and before the show. So I'm very excited to bring this guest on and we're going to have a great chat. And there's going to be a lot of value to take from the show, as always. If you're a writer, if you're new to this show, hello. Um, this is a good place to come and learn about an author and their career and their life and to take a lot of value in terms of writing tips and advice as well. And if you're a book lover, well, that's a great place to come as well because you get to learn about the insides and behind the scenes of a story writer as well. Um, happy Wednesday, Anna, in the chat. Anna, sorry, Anna and Anna. Um, Anna, thank you so much for saying happy Wednesday. And Michael uh, Potts, I'm looking forward to this. We are as well. Mr. Hooley um, is late. I don't know where he is, but I'm sure he will be here very shortly. And when he is, I will throw him on screen. Um, just a heads up, we have a show on Friday this week as normal, but we also have another show on Saturday. Chris Hooley will be sitting down with the amazing uh, Stephen J. Gold, who we've had on the show before, and he's got another um, a few things to talk about. So that will be happening on Saturday. So if you've got nothing planned Saturday, uh, please tune into that as well as supporting us as normal. Um, I put out a tweet this week. Uh, is it still called a tweet? Not entirely sure. Um, on X or Twitter um, to say about, you know, me and Chris needing like a, a garden shed studio. Um, it's because we've been running this show for uh, nearly four years now and things are starting to fall apart. And I say that quite literally today as I move my desk around every show uh, because I'm cramped in my bedroom. And this right here, this big chunk of wood, is the side of my desk that fell off, um, which is incredible. So currently it is propped up against the wall and hopefully it will stay there throughout this show because if it doesn't, then the camera will likely be pointing at the floor where it's fallen. Um, so hopefully that will last out. Uh, wish me luck for when I put that back. Um, if you've had a good week, let us know. If you haven't, let us know. But also, are, are you ready for Christmas? I certainly am not, but that is approaching very quickly. And we haven't quite planned a Christmas party show yet. So when that's going to happen, I don't know. And if it's going to happen, I don't know. If it isn't, we will try and do some sort of New Year's thing. But we will get some party in there online like we normally do. Um, around the festive season. So hopefully you are doing well. And if you're writing at the moment, I hope that's going well for you too. I know it's a very distracting time and there are lots of things to uh, to be distracted by. So if you have deadlines like tonight's guest, um, then be sure to factor that in and enjoy yourself around that as well. Um, so as Chris isn't here, I'm going to get tonight's guest on and we'll get into the chat and he can join in when he turns up. Hope things are well with him. So tonight we have the honor of hosting a literary luminary, a journalist whose pen has breathed life into Sunday Times bestsellers, and a storyteller who crafts thrilling tales that transport us to captivating worlds. Um, joining us is none other than the prolific author Ruth Kelly. Ruth's journey into the realm of journalism has seen her ghostwrite a string of Sunday Times bestsellers with her recent triumphs including The Prison Doctor, a literary sensation selling over 250,000 copies, and The Governor, a chart-topping masterpiece on Amazon and The Sunday Times. Her recent book, The Escape, which we'll talk about tonight, has also just become a Richard and Judy pick, which is incredible. Uh, congratulations for that. So please join me in wel welcoming get my words out, the amazing Ruth Kelly. Hello, Ruth. Welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. Hi. I don't know how I can follow that. <laughs> oh, you don't need to follow it. How are you doing? I'm great, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're more than welcome. Uh, I did get to chat to you at Harrogate, and it was a fantastic time, and um, hope things have been well for you since, and I know they are because The Escape is doing fantastically well, and I know you're working hard on new things as well. So, yeah, how, how have you taken all that? Um, it's been pretty well in since I've seen you, which wasn't that long ago, I don't think. September, uh, September yeah, it feels yeah. quite a long time ago, but it wasn't really, was it? 
Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Um, I've just been writing, busy on um, my current book that I'm working on since I last saw you, and then uh, doing the promotion for The Escape. And yeah, it's just one thing after another, but I can't complain. Yeah. Uh, whereabouts in the world are you today? Currently in Amsterdam. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you in Amsterdam? Because um, I live here. Um, I see you. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm half Dutch as well, but don't ask me to speak Dutch because. <laughs> I, I won't make you do that um yeah what's what's it like in Amsterdam um I know it's it's got its reputation for having kind of beautiful <laughs> culture uh, beautiful culture uh, okay beautiful architecture and you know a lovely place to be but as well as a place with a lot of like night, uh, nightlife and is that right um it <laughs> it's um it's you know it's absolutely stunning at christmas time um there's a there's a really special light show they put on here um and you can go on the um the boats and you can go around and see this light display there's like it's it's just stunning i think christmas wow. in amsterdam is the best time because it just looked like a little toy town with all the little windows and, and they're bright and the lights over the bridges and yeah i sound like an yeah. advert tourist advert here but it is really all, no. nice it's, it's fascinating um i know uh, i know it's got a, a great uh, mountain of architecture there and I, I saw an interesting video um about them that they clear the canal every year and they find thousands of bikes in there yeah that's right yeah they do yeah. and, and I've, I've seen them lift the bikes out it's like if you stand when they watch them and they just come bike after bike and they're all rusty and then they put them on the bridges and you're like wow <laughs> wow well i don't know why people keep throwing bikes in there but it's quite interesting right. um right. <laughs> yeah what what's the writing scene like in amsterdam Ooh, I'm kicking stuff over. Um, is um, there is there a lot of people there that you can connect with it in terms of being an author, or, or are people aware of you writing it in Amsterdam? Well, I had the villa. Um, my last book turned um, translated into Dutch, and that really took off here. Um, it was at the airport. It was all the shops. So I think I I think that did really well for me. But actually, at that point, I left for England. Um, yeah. I did a little spell in England again. So I actually, of all the time, the years I've been here, I didn't see it in the shops. Oh. But um, but yeah, I, um, it's, um, I don't think it's massive. The book, the book world here is different. Books are really expensive. And they're shocked whenever I tell my Dutch friends that you could pick up a book for 4 50 in a supermarket because every wow. book is about 20 euros here. That's um, incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and so and I was chatting to some of my Dutch friends the other day, and I said they were completely flabbergasted that um, my book would be four fifty, maybe on like half price offer in a supermarket, and they said, "Well, I mean, like, I I think I I would feel there was something wrong with the book if it was that cheap, and I wouldn't pick yeah. it up." <laughs> Wow. It's really a strange, yeah. You can't. There's a, there's a couple of there's um there is Waterstones in the city centre, and there's the American Book Centre where I did um. A book launch as well and they um you go in there and you won't get books for cheap it's just the way it is out here wow well i know in the uk and well all around the world people have incredible huge tbrs uh, to be read lists and a lot of people do buy physical books and keep that list growing and it must cost a fortune being 20 dollars or, or euros a, a book yeah <laughs> yeah Oof. i know incredible yeah, so um, in terms of England, when you come back to England, whereabouts in England do you come back to? Um, my family are based in Somerset, so I mostly go down there at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I and I grew up there from secondary school, so I okay. really I really feel like a country girl, probably yeah. at heart. That's definitely who I am. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of being a writer um, between Amsterdam and England, do you feel like there's any kind of more influence from one country or the other that gives you that inspiration to write good question but um <laughs> ooh, um i think the i don't, I don't know actually i, I don't really <laughs> connect with the readership here probably um but i do get in i definitely get inspiration from traveling and moving if i'm yeah. if i'm in the same place for too long i feel that my writing gets down and if i have writer's block i, I will literally just get up and move cafes and write in a different place and I think that sense of movement can really just break me through difficult parts of the book it's just strange I don't know how that physically can do that but it can so the yeah. same as I get on a train or a plane or I find a new place to work from I feel invigorated by it and that might help me um yeah so travel in that sense but I don't know if, if I see any difference between the mm. country 
countries, maybe. I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, something I highlight, I uh, picked up there was the fact you write in cafes. It's yeah. something I've done, but is that something you actually do quite often or do you have yeah. like, like, a dedicated <laughs> writing space? I love it. Um, yeah. it's, I find writing quite lonely um, and uh, I need some sort of background noise. And I have this ability to zone out most noise. Um, I feel like, I mean, I really love Joe and the Juice, um, but sometimes their dance tracks are really loud. <laughs> and like, I can't zone that out, um, even though I really love what they serve there. Um, and I I will, um, yeah, I ha it has to be sort of like a level that I can zone it out. But I, I like watching people, um, not, not, like, not in a creepy way, but I just like kind of like being, you know, like just watching interactions and just seeing people move around rather than just being on my own in a room. Otherwise it can, can the walls will come in on me a little bit because some of the things that I write about are a bit dark and yeah. um I don't know if I always like being in that because you have to really get into that place and sometimes it's nice to be in a, a busy environment when you're in mm. that place I know lots of writers would would differ from that and would rather be in their kind of little nook and write quietly but yeah yeah there's the, everyone has their own style but I think I agree, I agree with you that people give a lot of inspiration as well and people watching not in a creepy way is something <laughs> good to actually do um and distracting music is can be distracting but there are lots of people that use music including myself when writing and i i can only listen to a certain type of write, uh, music so it has to be quite chilled out with no lyrics in otherwise yeah. it does it takes away that concentration so yeah i think finding your writing space is is kind of a is, is a good key so if you haven't got the option of writing in a cafe mm. where's your next place to go oh i write at home for sure you know i can write at home, <laughs> but i just um i just like writing going out and um i i will write in like you know cafes and sometimes <laughs> I don't know why I'm confessing this. Um, I go to the top of like a shopping um, mall and I was just like, um, there's a there's a nice um, uh, department store here in Amsterdam and it's got a really nice cafe at the top. And then, oh, and nice. then if I, I go, well, like if I hit this deadline, then maybe I'll go downstairs and allow myself to have a little browse around. Ah, I think I, I work by a reward system. This is, sounds really crazy now, but it helps me. It helps me push through when I really have to get um, to the word limit. And I work by a word limit every day. Okay, what what target is that? It's a thousand words generally. Like okay. um, it might be, and if I get over that, that's just amazing. But I won't yeah. I won't set it too high because if I set it too high, then if I don't meet it, I'll I'll be pretty bummed out about it. Yeah, I think a thousand words is is pretty a decent target without being too much. I think two thousand yeah. is a push, but a thousand mm. is a good solid baseline. And I love the the idea of a writer <laughs> like yeah, I hit my word limit, I can have a treat. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> probably shouldn't uh, be doing that all the time, but yeah. Yeah, do it. If you can do it, do it. Um, hello, hello to you. Uh, she says, I love to write super gruesome scenes in public. Oh, and nice. give people weird smiles as they torture characters. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That, that's <laughs> fantastic. Um, this is why we love Halo. Um, okay, what we're going to do is going to play a very quick video. And then we're going to go into your road to writing, which is where we find out all about your kind of inspirations, okay. um, how you stepped into the world of writing and so on. So I'm going to play this video and we'll get straight into it. <laughs> What were your inspirations for writing at the very first stage and how did you step into that writing world? Like very first starting out. Like, yeah, right back, rewind the tape to it to where it all began. Where it all began. Um well I was I I just um I'd finished university and I had been um traveling in Australia and I came back home to my family in Somerset and I had my heart set on going to um Canada and uh family were like well you better get a job and <laughs> um and i didn't know what to do i really i'd studied english at university i had no idea i hadn't i had no ambition for anything i just wanted to go traveling and uh dad applied my dad applied for some jobs for me um, <laughs> he applied um so <laughs> i think he was living vicariously through me and he applied for mi5 i'm not joking about this and he applied um, for a job on the local paper. He just like 
sent out all these applications unbeknown to me. Wow. And um, she will get a job. <laughs> she will get a job. And then she'll get like a, a cool job, which I really yeah. like. And uh, he did tell me about MI5, and then I told everybody about it. So that probably wouldn't have worked out even if I got the interview, because you're not supposed to tell anyone, apparently. Right. And then um, I got an interview for the newspaper, for the local newspaper. And I had no clue what I was going in for, what it was about. I turned up. Um, I actually, yeah, I turned up. It was in Western Superman. It was for um, uh, it was for the Bridgewater Times, in um, which would just be in the actual town centre. And uh, no experience. Turned up and I got the job. Um, wow. And and I'm, I was very surprised because I was extremely shy. Um, coming, I was really, really shy person, and journalism is something that's um, it's not easy to do if you're shy. Um, so yeah, I got, I, I just, I was thrown in at the deep end. I had to um, write an entire weekly paper, which is one other person in this uh, in this office in the town centre. It was a massive workload, and I had to turn up on doorsteps and do a huge amount of jobs and pushing me into very difficult and awkward positions when I was a, quite a shy person just door knocking doing these things and I think it I don't know it, something clicked and I just um I enjoyed the writing and I enjoyed getting the stories and um it took off and then it became a bit of a whirlwind after that I went from paper to paper quickly moving up um to daily papers then I went to national papers in in London um freelancing I I kind of stuck with with always um doing freelance stuff. I like the variety of changing between newspapers. I would go from the daily mail to do whatever. I did them all really. And then I I realized that I preferred spending a bit more time with one character. Um, and that was possible through features rather than news stories. So I, I went more into magazines, feature writing, did a lot of work for Grazia magazine, um, Cosmopolitan magazine, mm -hmm. Glamour magazine, did all these, all these mags, these, these kind of first person features. And then um, <laughs> um, this is like this is like really like nonstop this train. And then I um and then I uh, made some contacts at um, Penguin and they um they gave me a bit of a challenge. It was not the usual thing, I that the way you get into book writing, but they they um they asked me if I would find, there was a story that they particularly liked and they'd seen in the newspapers. And they asked me if I could track down this couple that were anonymous. And if I could, and I could persuade them to do a book with me, um, they would give me a book deal. Wow. Yeah, it was really random. And um, and I managed to do it because I, I, at the time I had these great like newspaper skills of being able to find people. And, and we did this, uh, we did this book together and that was my first book and that led into ghostwriting. Um, which seemed like a natural progression from writing mm. features for magazines. It was just extending a, a, a feature into a, like um, basically a book. And I had no experience of writing books. I had no idea how to write a book, but I just had to do it with a ridiculous deadline. And um, the whole thing was highly pressurized. And then um, I got um, a couple more books and then uh, they, they were, um, there's different ways you can go about ghostwriting. Either the publisher assigns you to a person to write for, or you find the subject and you go to the publisher with the with the story. So I, at the beginning of my career, I was assigned to people, and then I decided to find people, use my journalism skills to, to find people for books. And that's what I that I kind of went to after that, and I found um, most of my stories that way. And then, um, and then I, uh, I was finding that I was becoming more and more creative in the stories that I was writing, the way that I was crafting the narrative, probably going beyond what was asked of me of a ghostwriter. And I wanted to be that. I wanted to be more creative with the timeline. By the time I wrote The Governor, which was my last ghost book, I was um, doing flashbacks to the past. So I would do a normal ghost book about a memoir about someone's life would be chronological from the start to the end. Yeah. But I, I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted it to be to give a bit more something special to the book. So I, I um, the governor, I wrote her life um, in in the present tense, and then I slipped back into the past doing flashbacks, and and then I realised then that I absolutely I loved being. I just needed to be more creative, and that was never going to be possible. Um, 
writing for other people because I was always going to be confined within the words that I was given from that mm. person. Even though I loved ghost writing, it was always going to be capped by this limitation of having to be this other person and be this character. And I just needed the freedom. <laughs> so yeah. then, yeah. It's, then it's I just really... went wild and wrote the villa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting kind of thing to do. And and I know people might want to look into that. Is there a way that they could, if they, if they don't know how to get into ghostwriting, is there a way that you know that they could approach that? Yeah. Um, if, um, so that, like I said, there's two routes. You can either, uh, you can either um, get in via the publisher and get known to them as someone that would want to to write, you know, be a ghostwriter for them. So you could become maybe create a profile as a ghostwriter and then and then try and get on their list. So they'll be you'd be their go-to to be the writer. Or this would this is what I would suggest is that you would try and find someone that you think might make a great book. You know, you read the newspapers, um, stories. You know, so you look at the newspapers, you see what stories out there and you think wow if I interviewed this person wouldn't that make an incredible story and it's often not the obvious story so um you know you might have a breaking news story come out and, and you think well that that might be a good story but it would only make a newspaper article you have to think about would this make an entire book whose life story would be interesting and that's the difference like an actual thing that passes in the news would that could you spread that out over a book unlikely but often it's the quiet people the unassuming people the unsung heroes of this world that make the really nice stories and if you've got an eye for it you just keep looking and you maybe it might be someone that you're you're sitting around with a group of friends or you've got you know I've met it's it's um the prison doctor was um, the mother of a friend of mine. We would, I went, you know, he invited, he wanted me to meet his mum. I met his mum and she just within five minutes of speaking to her, she told me what she did, worked in a prison as a doctor. And it was like, bingo, that's just a book. And I was like, okay. And, and I think, you know, people have such, everyone, everyone has a story to tell. I know that sounds like a cliche, but there's so <laughs> many stories out there. It's just about, um, it's about listening to people. It's been about being a good listener. And taking the time to hear their story it's really easy i think to get into it if you if you kind of want to reach into that world yeah. it's a great way to break into writing as well because it trains you how to um construct a novel um because you follow the same principles of how to break it down a chapter how to make it a page turn nothing is different there from a fiction book um and you have the support of working with someone on their story. So you have their structure with you. So if you wanted to try and get into fiction, it could be a kind of a way in. Yeah, I really like the concept as well, because as you mentioned, you're telling someone's story and they might not have ever had the thought of doing that. And once that's done, they've got that to keep forever. You know, you, you, they portrayed themselves through you and their story is now out there. And even if it's not directly linked to them in terms of, um, you know actual details then they can still they know themselves what that story is you know yeah i think i think um i've worked with so many people that found that telling their life story has been life-changing it's always been cathartic and they've like cried to me afterwards saying you've helped me like it's i think the power of a book it's just almost like they put it down on paper it's done it's it's like they can now move on it just seems to be something incredibly powerful yeah, it's fantastic. So what what one tip then could you give anyone um that's watching or listening back to this from your time as a as a journalist go into a ghostwriting kind of writer? What one tip did you learn from that process that you could pass on? To be really unjudgmental. So when you when you write um maybe as a journalist, I think journalists can go in with an agenda when they interview someone. But as a ghostwriter, you are not going in to judge someone. You're literally going in to listen to them and to um, to write their story. So you have to just be a really good listener and be able to, um, to just be completely um, neutral about what they're saying. Yeah. And the more neutral you are, the more they'll open up to you because they can trust you. Um, and that I think that's the key to the success with ghostwriting. Yeah. So you can find people, you can get their trust. Maybe you should have been in MI5. Um, <laughs> Maybe. I'm hey, wasting, aren't I? Yeah. Halo <laughs> said, uh, I tried to apply for MI5 in Scotland, ironically. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. So 
it's a bit of a feature. Um, okay, so you then moved into the fiction world, as you mentioned, uh, creating your own work. How did that feel when you finally got into that and, and released your first book as you? Um, so it felt like freedom. <laughs> I mean, I loved ghostwriting, but I felt like I can say what I want now. Yeah. After years of um, being someone else, literally being someone else. So, and then, and then I had to, re to rein in my words, you know, like you go wild with what you want to say and your expressions and your metaphors and your adjectives. And you're like, okay, maybe you're just going too crazy now. So, um, I found it liberating and mm. I loved it, but I also found it harder for sure because I was used to ghostwriting and now you have a complete blank canvas. You don't have the guidelines of somebody else yeah. um, to help you. And it's, I found it cha really challenging. Did you feel like, obviously when you're ghostwriting, obviously it's your work, but then you weren't kind of attached to it in that sense. So when you released your first fiction novel with your name on the front, did you then feel a whole sense of, what's the word I'm looking for here? Did you feel like you were going to be judged personally in, in, compared to your kind of ghostwriting stories? I didn't um, know. In, in fact, because I hadn't ever been, I'd been, in, well, that's why you're called a ghostwriter, because you're literally yeah. invisible. Um, I was used to that. So the shock of reviews and that world of suddenly being in the spotlight did, did shock me actually and I wasn't prepared for it well it wasn't like I wasn't prepared for it but I I kind of um I was surprised by it and I was suddenly um I was suddenly being seen and I like I said when I when I started journalism I'm really shy and I think um yeah I I, I never wanted the I know you don't go into ghost writing if you want the glory of and the yeah. fame of your name so that never bothered me um and now I was suddenly <laughs> getting like Oh, all these reviews and appearing on shows and the first um yeah the first podcast I did I was like oh <laughs> <laughs> um well you know you know and that was great you know loving loving it <laughs> well it, it's it's kind of a a regular story that an, an author is kind of someone who is a bit of a recluse and and sticks to themselves gets their work done so it's quite hard for for someone to step into the limelight in that sense especially when your books are going from strength to strength and then becoming more um out there in the in the writing world so do you feel like you're being a shy person you're getting into that rhythm now where you can actually obviously come on a live show now um and you think moving forward you're going to be okay with telling your story and and being able to deal with that kind of um the more popular kind of world as your books get more popular as well I hope so I feel really proud of where I've come from and and doing the ghost writing and the newspapers and if I can you know I don't know if I've got if I can help people but I think I I had some experience that might might you know offer some um encouragement to people that you know I I did some hard graft to get here yeah. and, I, and I carried on and I carried on and, I, and you know now I've got Richard and Judy behind me so it, it's like it was worth it and you know you just keep going just keep, that yeah. that would be the big advice that i would say don't give up keep going we'll talk about the richard and judy thing in a minute when we go on to the escape but um it's 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 impressive to go from strength to strength and feel proud for yourself because a lot of people don't do that um they they, they can progress and go strength to strength but it's taking that time to reflect on your own journey and realizing where you are so i think that's really important to do um but i was interested when you mentioned flashbacks earlier on and that you you really like kind of putting that into your work. So how do you approach a flashback and how do you, what tips would you give someone to work on a flashback if they haven't done that before? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Go ahead. I need a moment. Um, a flashback. Um, I think, um, not to be too vague you can i think the tendency is to, with a flashback is to be a little bit too too vague i think um and i and i think you need to it has to have a really specific purpose when i was doing the governor i'm just thinking about that it was i i picked i picked flashbacks that would explain 
that would lead on to the next chapter that was in the present tense, it, you know, it, it, I would think about that flashback and I think, what am I trying to say in this? And how is that revealing something that's going to keep the pace and the progression of the novel? So, because I think a flashback can slow the, the narrative down. So you've got to be really choosy about what you're picking and and, re and think about why you're doing it and what's, what's the intention behind the flashback. But I think they can be extremely effective. I'm not sure if I've helped there, but um, no, that, that's great. How, how would you give a tip to someone who's who's trying to write one? What what kind of writing techniques should they look look for or to do? Um, I'm trying to think if I use the flashback in the escape. Hmm. Um, I'm just trying to think about a recent flashback I did, so I can draw on it. I know there were flashbacks in the villa. Um, so in the villa, um, my previous book. Um, my main character flashed back to, to her, her relationship with her ex-boyfriend. And uh, there was some, you know, there's some bad moments in that. So when in the, in the current situation that she was on in this villa, if, if something happened that would prompt that old feeling um, and bring it back, that was a way of introducing her past into the storyline. So we got to know her a bit better and what might be... Um, what might be affecting her but without giving too much away and yeah. I think that's the effect of the flashback that it 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 feeds in some information unveils something about their character but doesn't give it all away so it leaves you wanting more I yeah. think Maybe. No, that's great. That's great. I mean, you you could obviously use that for many reasons, for obviously d displaying the character's kind of past life as well, but also leaving little breadcrumbs in there if you've got kind of breadcrumbs. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, we're going to go on to part two of the show, which is about the escape. Uh, we can talk about the Richard and Judy stuff, which is fantastic. And hopefully you've got a copy there so you can read your blurb for everybody. Uh, so we can learn about the story and then we can look into it. Okay. So part two, come in right up. Uh, so, Ruth, do you have your copy? Excellent. And could you please let everyone know what the escape is all about? Um, okay, so I could read. I could read from the back. Um, the perfect <laughs> offer. When struggling influencer couple Adele and Jack post a crowdfunding video online, they're amazed when a mysterious benefactor offers to buy them a crumbling French chateau. It's the lifeline they need to leave. It's the lifeline they need to leave all their troubled troubles behind. For Adele, it's a dream come true. She will post videos of the renovation as thousands of online subscribers follow their journey. But the chateau is not all it seems and the local community is far from welcoming. When Adele's videos suddenly stop, her sister Erin visits the visits to make sure she's okay, but the couple have vanished. Between the obsessions of Adele's fans and the claustrophobic secrecy of the nearby town, Erin must unveil the shocking truth behind the couple's disappearance. Ooh. So, in a nutshell, it's a crowdfunding venture that goes murderously, murderously wrong. <laughs> Which sounds amazing, and we all love a story like that. So, um, there's a couple of things there. The setting, for a start, sounds nice and ominous. You've got a, a crumbling chateau, which is normally quite an isolated place anyway. Why did you feel that that was the right setting for this story? I just... Um... I just thought it was, um, I wanted, I think there was something in me that wanted to write something gothic. And a lot of people describe the book in, in that way. And I had this urge to kind of, um, you know, do that. And I just thought that a chateau would be perfect for it. Um, I um, I like shows like Chateau Rescue DIY. So, and I was, yeah. I was, I was fascinated by this renovate these renovation projects which is a big part of the book um wanting to renovate something from scratch start a life over um so all these little thing all these little different things were coming together when i was putting the plot together i've spent a lot of time in france um yeah. all over france so france i knew was going to happen especially in the french countryside when in in a kind of a really remote isolated place um and the the YouTube angle, I um, I'm really I I spend way too much time on YouTube when I should be writing as a distraction, um, procrastinating. And I and I I think as a journalist, um, the same with the villa. I notice trends. I like tapping into 
to things that are, are kind of trending and hot. And I, I noticed there was a shift in the way that um, uh, YouTube videos were being made. There was this, this you know, the traditional YouTube was that people would um, make a video and then within that video um, uh, they would uh, earn revenue from advertising or, um, you know, um, product placements or whatever it was. And and that that's the way it's been for some time. But I was seeing this shift to this, um, this new kind of breed of YouTuber that was was using GoFundMe as a platform um, to um, to to fund their dreams, and that was and that was I kind of got this you know I seen people go fund me a, a cup of coffee, go fund me a new roof for my house, and again linked to renovation projects, and I thought well, what what happens? I think I saw all these things were going around in my head, and what happens if someone was to um, uh, go fund someone put a crowdfunding project and then someone put in actual a lot of money for this project who actually owned this building then I think that was the crux of the the question in my head when when you start asking people for help you know who who really owns it then are you are you sort of beholden to that person I think that throws up lots of questions and that and then came on this um this uh benefactor who um this mystery one and, and what you know he he pays for this building but what does he really want in return because mm. in, you know there is no such thing as a free lunch and and kind of and all these things were coming together um and um yeah I think it was kind of an unusual concept as well I always want to hop on something that's just a bit different I don't want to I don't I want to follow I want to tap into trends but I want to create something that's that's gonna like make a bit of a a trend something different yeah well, it sounds very, very much on point. I mean, you're right, in, and the YouTube and the, and the social media, it's very much relevant to what I'm doing. And everyone who's in that world will relate to this story. It's it's a murder mystery, a gothic murder mystery, but also thrown in the modern society as well. So I think that's very, very relevant and could well be a Netflix type of show. Um, I'd love to see something like that as well. So there you go. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be the first time someone's been on the show and gone there, so let's hope so. But also, yeah, it, it sounds fantastic, and Halo said in the chat as well, it sounds amazing, and it really does. Um, so how did you decide what kind of characters would would be the, the right kind of fit for a story like this? Yeah, tricky. I I, um, I knew I wanted sisters in there. Um, I wanted, a, I wanted um, sisters to be really close, but also to be squabbling, and... Yeah. So both both my characters are flawed, um, and they highlight each other's flaws as they go along. At first, you might think, so it's, it begins with um, Adele, the YouTuber. She's really quite young, and she has kind of a slightly irritating tone to her, and I and that really comes across at the start of the book. But as her story progresses, the older sister, who's quite scathing of her, you see that she's also got flaws, and um, uh. And you see how, um, and then and then through through what they need to, what they go through, it actually brings them together. So, um, how did I pick them? I knew that I wanted the YouTuber to be young. She had to be really young. Um, and I've seen a lot of YouTubers. Um, so the the book begins with her crying on her. It begins with her vlog, and she's crying. And I've seen a lot of YouTubers. You know, they, there's a, there's like this trend for that where they're crying. They're going, oh, I, I really feel like I need to be honest about what I'm doing. I mean, you see that on every single YouTube at the moment. And um, she's saying, I'm really unhappy about where I am, and but I'm really like that I can be honest with you. So I I jumped on that trend when I was yeah. doing. It. I thought I thought that was quite relevant. Um, and yeah, you you might start off feeling irritated by her, but I think actually you know you end up feeling quite sorry for her because she's projecting this perfect life and she wants it through her vlogs but actually is life so perfect mm. in this dream home she thought she she thought the move to France would um you know uh like make her relationship with her her boyfriend better and I think perhaps a lot of people come and relate to that they they in there somewhere in their head they have this vision that if they have the second house abroad, you know, maybe that might change everything, that sort of, that living abroad, that dream. You know, there's so many programs throughout the day on like that second home abroad, people going to choose them. So I kind of thought that was really, that was really relevant and people might, might be able to, you know, um, identify with that. So I think even though Adele is, 
slightly annoying YouTuber. You should also have really human, human, you know, characteristics that everyone can see. You know, having, yeah. having wanting to renovate a building abroad is, is is something that everybody would really want to do. I think somewhere in their hearts. I mean, I would. It would be really nice. Yeah. Um, and then um, the baddies. Yeah, I think I I don't. It's not usual that I make a book up as I go along, but something happened. I wrote this book really quickly um, in six months, and um, I if I sort of knew what the midway twist was going to be, and I sort of vaguely knew what they were sort of. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm choosing my words really carefully not to yeah don't no spoilers no spoilers but I knew what they were they were going to be about but I think definitely who how horrible they were sort of got worse and worse as this book was going along and I was literally like I think I was slightly pantsering it towards the end um which um which I don't know I, I never thought I would do that but I did do that and it, and it flowed pretty quickly for it yeah I think that's a sign of a good story uh that it it's within you a good stories there because when you when you can just let it come out is it's obviously the right kind of story because when you you're forcing the idea it might not be the kind of right one so when you've got that natural flow i think that's that's a, a sign of a really good natural story for you um and also i think as i mentioned i think it's really on point in all the characters you've, you've chosen the the landscape the social media aspect of it as well i think that's really relevant um and and looking at france and the chateaus i've seen the programs as well and there's an amazing amount of incredible buildings in france the chateaus that are just they look something out of a fairy tale they're left to rot they look very gothic it's it's just the perfect setting for the story yeah yeah and you think it's going to be right and then you and then you realize that you is like a, a a like a pit like you just might as well throw your money away because there's just yeah, endless yeah. amounts of money that needs to be spent on re refurb um yeah. but i think people are I, I think um the nation is fascinated by um renovation projects i think it's yeah. just it's just something it's a big thing i'm more fascinated in what was what was before and the secrets of the past so oh okay so, that's a secret. yeah Better, so yeah. somewhere like that yeah that was in my mind would be straight away ooh, let's discover the the bad bits but you're right i think it's the idea of the golden ticket as it were for for perhaps social media people to then make it in that world but then to not be the what they thought it was is also a great concept so yeah uh, amazing and and if you want to buy that book guys uh ladies and gentlemen watching or listening back i will post a link in the description so please pick it up and support uh, our author today um Right, we're going to move on and, and ask some final questions in part three. But before we do that, obviously, this book has been recently selected as a Richard and Judy Club book pick. Yeah. Um, that is incredible news and congratulations for that. But how did you find out about that and how did that make you feel? Um, so you're, um, you're told a little bit earlier um, than when it actually comes out you are warned about it but you're you're sworn to secrecy mm. um, you're not allowed to tell anyone um, and um, I remember getting the news from my editor in the morning and uh, I couldn't believe it it was quite a casual email so it was just like and yeah, so you've um, been picked as Rich and Judy, and I just like reread it, <laughs> and I just reread it again, and I just was like, "What?" <laughs> and I think I wrote back, "You're joking." And um, and then I remember I was, I'm not like, I'm not, I don't. It takes me a lot to like um, cry, actually. Like I'm not that much, really emotional. And then I just remember driving into. Um, I was, I'm working on book three at the moment. So I was working on book three at that moment. I was driving into town um, to work in the cafe, as I said, I like doing. And I just burst into tears. Oh. I just, I felt really overwhelmed by the news. I like, it was just, it it meant everything to me. Mm. I felt, it felt like, it felt like the seal of approval that I, I'd, I'd never, you know, I never expected it. And it just came out of the blue. It knocked me. It was, I blindsided me. And I just felt totally emo that day. And, <laughs> um, and then it gave me a huge boost of confidence ever since that. Cause I thought, well, okay, that's, you know, even if, even if I might be struggling with writing book three, it's, you know, it's perhaps not flowing as, you know, easily as book two did. Um, you know, I, I, I've got, I've got this. So just carry on, you know, just, just keep going. And, 
um, it wasn't an easy path to get here. Um, I did a, you know, working on these newspapers, I did a, a lot of tough stories and um, I've, um, it's been a lot of hard graft. So I think that was, that was the most amazing thing about it. Um, that I felt like, you know, every time, and I'm sure a lot of writers say that every time they were near giving up, you know, and they, and they go into themselves, just one more book, just, you know, yeah. just one more book, keep going. I've been at those points in my life um, where I thought it's time to just quit the industry and to go into PR um, or something like that. I don't know that I could use my skills, but just in a different way, um, more reliable job, et cetera. And I think getting this Richard and Judy made me feel like you were right. So you were right not to give up. And I think if, any, if I could say anything to anyone listening right now, it'd be, you know, don't give up like just keep going um because i never expected this to happen to me so um it's just you know if you want it bad enough if you really believe in what you're doing just don't give up amazing fantastic i mean it's it, as i said it's a great thing to do uh have that recognition and and it's giving you that confidence and inspiration to carry on now and that's that's all good um and hopefully book three uh, does just as well and like I said I want to see this coming out on the TV somewhere so one day let's see um, okay we're going to go on to part three which is community questions if if you're watching this right now live uh, you can send in some questions if you have any uh, and in between that I will be asking our staple questions on the writing community chat show so here's part three of the show community questions <laughs> So this is the time where the questions get a bit sideways, uh, but not always. Um, so my first question I want to ask uh, that was random was when you go to these coffee shops for your writing, as you do <laughs> often, shops. Uh, whatever they're called. Um, what's your, <laughs> not what's those your... coffee shops in Amsterdam, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's, <laughs> what's your drink of choice when you go into the, the writing shop, as it were? Oh, uh, espresso. Yeah, I'm, I love this. Uh, I like it really strong. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I don't know what coffee shops you refer to there, by the way. Uh, never <laughs> been. Um, okay. If you had the ability to step into any fictional world created by another author, what world would you step into and why? Oh. Um... Ooh. That's a tough uh, one. Any fictional world. Um... It could be a, a TV show or a film as well. We can open it up. Oh, you put me on the spot now. Um... Do you want to? Do you want to skip that one? Can I? Can I come back to it? Come back to it. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Let's see what we got next. Um, if you weren't a writer, what career would you pursue? And uh, possibly we might know that already. <laughs> What the MI5? Um, <laughs> um, what would I do? I'd like to be a doctor. Okay. Yeah, I'm really interested in um, medicine and kind of health and well-being. So I think I, that I would absolutely love to do that, actually. Yeah. That's, totally that's random really... and different, but yeah. Yeah. It's a very tough job, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so if you could take any fictional character... Uh, again, TV, film, or book, and put that into one of your stories. Is there a fictional character you'd want to put into your stories? Yeah, I, I, um, I think um, I think um, from Sherlock Holmes, um, Watson would be a really good character because he's um, he's just um, he's just kind of in the background, and he would be really amazing um, to bounce ideas off and um to run theories past without sort of like overwhelming you with his character i think he'll be the yeah the perfect character to have there um yeah. and uh, yeah you could yeah um completely patient all the time and um yeah i think i think his character is absolutely genius Fantastic. brings out your sort of your character by you know by being there yeah great answer um halo thank you for your question what part of the publishing process surprised you the most 
Um, so the wait for the book to come out mm. in, in ghostwriting, the turnaround time is really rapid. And I would have to, I've had to write a book in six weeks. I've had to write, um, yeah, that wasn't, that's happened to me. Um, and by the, it's, it's a lot less time that it, the whole thing turns out. So when, when, um, when the villa came out, it seemed like so so much time had passed since when it finally came out that yeah, I was already writing the escape and my head was somewhere else and I it was it was it was different. And then also, um, when I'm also used to newspapers before that, I mean the turnaround time was that just you know a matter of hours. So there is quite a length of time with fiction, and um, that surprised me. Yeah, it it really is. I mean, a lot of people, including yourself, have mentioned. That you, you know you're promoting one book and you're working on the next so it must be quite distracting in that sense i think it's um it's it's you're you're jumping characters literally in your head so um i'll talk to you um now which i'm absolutely loving about the characters in the escape but also um tomorrow morning i'm gonna jump into the characters who i'm doing um at the moment for book three and yeah, it's, it's um it's a strange process because you're so involved with these characters you're literally you are them and you're kind of you're you know you're speaking those words and um it, it can be a bit strange yeah um mm. but it's all right i'm coping i'm coping <laughs> yeah good uh, okay if you could take the ending of any story whether that be a tv show a film or a book and you could change the ending what ending would you choose and why? Can I do two? Can I be greedy and give you two? Yeah, of course you can. Um, so I think Jack and Rose, um, <laughs> do you know what I'm going to say? Um, Go on. Sh should grow old together at the end of Titanic. Uh, I don't know if anyone else agrees with me. I just think, you know, they just should, okay. <laughs> and... Um, I don't want to ruin this for anyone, but it had, this film has been out for some time. Okay. Um, but the last Bond film, I mean, I don't really like Bond dying. I'm sorry. It just didn't work for me. I felt really disappointed at the end when I was sat in that. Yeah. In fact, I felt a bit heartbroken. I just was like, no. I did, did you watch it? Yeah, I've seen it, yeah. Did you, do you agree or did you? Um, did you I, I kind of agree. I think it's a timeless kind of film that should carry on as it always has done. But I think it's... There's a lot of pressure in the world at the moment for, um, what's the word, change for certain reasons. Um, mm. So a lot of a lot of films or industries like that feel like they need to change things because of the pressures of society, if that makes sense. So perhaps if it was a different time, then Mr. Bond would have carried on as is. So I, I think it's more of a forced change rather than... Um, then I don't know. It's it's a strange one because they've introduced new characters. I think's brilliant, but mm. then why why kill off a character that's never died off in all of the films yeah. before? So it's a bit of an odd one for me. I would have liked to see to see. I, I really like Daniel Craig as James Bond as well. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I I think it's a good one to change. Um, I, I'm assuming you would just keep him alive and carry on that tradition. I, I, I think it was about, um, so if you want to talk about character development, I thought in my heart, I was just like, Bond's invincible. Yeah. Um, and I, I really like his character for always being invincible. So when he becomes vulnerable and he actually dies, it was just like, mm. oh, <laughs> I felt like I'd been robbed. Um, but, you know, I think, like, it's just, um, yeah, I've got to get over it. <laughs> That's a, It's a really good point because... Now, any any replacement Bond or 00, uh, 00, <laughs> 00, no, no, no. yeah, 007, it's like mortalized, like you said, because it can be any old kind of show now. It feels less valuable, if that makes sense. Yeah. Just be I replaced. Think so. mm. I think so, yeah. And also, Jack, Jack and Rose, first time we've heard that one. Um, oh, really? Really? Yeah. No one's said that before. Come on. No one's ever said that. I think <laughs> I think that's quite a good good answer. But how would they survive? Would, do you think there's enough <laughs> room on the old door, which has <laughs> often been debated in that in the past? Um, well, they would have been rescued, and then and then they would have um, you know got a nice little house together, and um, you know they they they're from different backgrounds, but they would have worked it out, and then yeah. Um, <laughs> and they what, were what about? Romeo and Juliet in that sense. 
Oh, I guess it's the same thing, but it just doesn't feel as current, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, I get, having the heart strings tugged, not ever going to be together. I don't know. It seems more right with Romeo and Juliet. I can't put my finger on why, but I think Jack and Rose should have been together. It's just all a bit sad. And also to, you know, to freeze to death in the water. It's, just, mm. it's not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> uh brilliant okay we've done uh favorite place to write um okay what hobbies do you have outside writing yoga i'm a big yoga fanatic yeah yoga. i am um, i love yeah i go all the time and if i'm not doing that i'm running um so it's exercise to sort of um give me that sort of like change from sitting because also because writing can um really kind of put a lot of strain across your shoulders and um, particularly this part here um, because of the way that your posture is and mm. I find that um, I'm sorry this is probably really boring for everyone but I find that like yoga really like stretches that back or um, and really helps with that sometimes it becomes so bad that I can get you know when I'm really on a deadline my fingers can get a little bit numb because these nerves get a little bit trapped and so um, yeah the hardships have been a riser <laughs> For me. No, I think that's um, great yeah. advice. They, that's the most the first, I think, probably physical advice we've had for writers. Oh, uh, make sure make sure you stretch. You do yoga so your arms and shoulders can relax. And yeah, I do like these nerve flossing exercises as well to like keep that going. Um, and it really relieves them. You can like look them up on YouTube. Did and... you say nerve flossing? Yeah, nerve flossing. Yeah, I told you I was into medicine and stuff. Never yeah, heard you... that before. Yeah, you kind of stretch the nerves and it kind of releases the tension because it's all built up there. And um, and then it's fine again. Um, and uh, yeah, I am. Um, what else do I do? Um, just the usual stuff like seeing my friends. I'm quite silly, really. I like <laughs> just like doing like <laughs> I like um, I like being with my friends a lot. And um, I would like to say paint, painting used to be a massive part of my life, but I haven't really done it so much. I think the, the writing's taken over, but I am quite arty. Nice. Um, but yeah, different creative endeavors. Okay, cool. I, I'm not artistic at all. You know, um, no, I, I could draw a good stick, man. I think that's oh, about it. That's um, yeah. Okay. Uh, before we wrap this up, then, because we're approaching that hour, uh, if you were looking, our, our morbid question of the show if you're on your deathbed many, many, many years down the line, looking back on your career, what would success look like to you? Um, Well, in a superficial answer would be fortune and glory. Um, like, but um, I think I would really love um, one of my books to be turned into a TV or film. Okay, that, was, that would probably be the, a, a great thing just because I'm really into watching. Yeah. Oh, so when you ask me what I like doing, um, I really, I spend a lot of time watching Netflix and TV shows. Um, I'm really into film and TV and I, and I think it gives me a lot of ideas for my books. Because mm -hmm. I think the two are just, you know, totally integrated. So yeah. that would be a dream thing. Um, although, you know, I, I some amazing things have happened. So I can't complain right now. <laughs> Not at all. Um, I think, I'm, I'm going to put it out there. I, I think the escape is perfect for the screen. So if it happens, we will <laughs> refer back to this episode. And um, I'll, I will do it. I told you so sort of thing. Um, yeah, no, I think I think I'm very much the same in terms of loving TV and film for story as well. Um, so screenplays are something that I've dabbled in and I'm dabbling in. Is that something that you would ever consider? Yeah, I'd absolutely love to do it. I mean, I, I don't know how you do it. I, I might have to do a like um, brush up course on it or something. I don't know how you get into it, but I would be totally interested in it. Um, from what I gather, is you have to, it's quite di dialogue heavy, mm. so um, yeah, I might have to master that. But um, I think the more strings, is that the phrase "strings to your bow"? What's the phrase? The more, yeah, yeah, the more that you have, the the, the better. Maybe your writing will be because you you just um, experiment on all these different things, and I think they're all going to add color to your writing. So it's never going to be a bad thing. I think it's good to try things new, and then and um, and then you'll find that you'll never get stale with what you're writing because you're experiencing all these different things. Yeah, 
great advice. Love that. Um, okay, finally, where can people find your writing? Where can they find out more about you? Where can they get all that stuff? Uh, so um, I'm on Instagram at, and Twitter and at Ruthie, um, Ruthie Writer, and that's R-U-T-H-Y Writer. And yeah, come follow me. I, I love interacting with people and um, yeah, just come come follow me. And in terms of my book, it's currently out <laughs> at W. H. Smith um, for the Rich and Judy, um, the exclusive edition. And in that, it's really worth getting. Um, here comes the plug because uh, we I've put together some book club questions at the end, so it's a bit different um, and about like, related to the escape. And I've also done a little bit about why I've written the book. Um, so you've got some extra information from me, content. Amazing. Fantastic. Ruth, thank you so, so much uh, <laughs> for joining us and telling your story. It's been fantastic. Halo, thank you. Thank you for your questions, Halo. Um, they've been fantastic. Yeah, and <laughs> Yeah. Um, it, hang on a second. What's I say? It also wasn't a very well-written death. Um, there you go. I'm assuming, would that be Titanic? I'm not sure. Um, but she says, Anna says, fabulous interview as well. Thank you so, so much for your support, guys. It means the world. As I said, show on Friday and Saturday. And we've had one today. It's Wednesday. Oh, sorry. She meant James Bond. Um, makes sense. Uh, We're, yeah, in agreement. We're in agreement. You're terrible. <laughs> you didn't um, even bother. You didn't even bother to jump off the building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's been wonderful to have season 13 up and running uh, we had a fantastic show with tina baker joining us last week for a good chat uh which was a lot of fun if you haven't checked that out please do so hit the like button if you haven't done that and obviously subscribe all that good stuff and check out the escape I, again i'll leave the links in the description so please pick it up or go to wh miss as uh, ruth said so thank you so so much and we will see you in the week hopefully you are prepared for christmas um if not get on it it's only a couple of weeks away um and that's it from us guys thank you so so much we'll see you very soon bye, -bye.